Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of MUM Talks, where I'm hosting the Secretary General of Lyman 2023, Olivia. Olivia, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here. No, of course, I'm really glad um, to be on here and very excited for this podcast. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us. Um, before I go ahead and start asking you some of the questions that I have here, and I have some interesting questions for today, I'm just going to give a very brief overview as to who you are, and I'm pretty sure most of our audience already recognizes you. But um, So Olivia is the Secretary General of London International Model and Nations 2023, the largest MUN conference in Europe. She is a recent graduate of King's College London with a degree in History and International Relations. And she's been a part of the global, I guess, MUN network, I can call, since the age of 15. Am I correct with that? With that last yeah. fact? Yeah. Yep. Which is a pretty early age. I started doing it, it is. in university. So I'm always impressed mm -hmm. seeing people who started much, much earlier than myself. So without further ado, I want to start with some of the relatively recent developments in your life, Olivia. I know you were announced as the Secretary General of Lyman 2023 about 10 months ago. And I have an idea of how that process was, but I want to ask and, and listen from your perspective a little bit. How was the past 10 months? Um, it's been very hectic. It is actually almost 10 months. Uh, I got elected on 1st of May. I remember very clearly. Um, so, yeah, it's been very hectic kind of from selecting your, your deputy secretary general to selecting your entire team to kind of, you know, you're essentially starting an entire conference from scratch, even though oh, yeah. Lyman obviously has a pretty long history because it's my vision. And then from my vision, you're captaining a ship of people who come into Lyman with their ideas. And then it becomes, it, it then starts becoming a shared vision, a collective vision that then you kind of start working on. So I'd say it's been a very hectic journey with Lyman. Uh, it's something that I've really enjoyed doing. And it's something that I'm really enjoying to um, doing now still. So um, it's been very fun, very hectic, and I'm very, very happy to um, to be doing Lyman this year. It's a pleasure to have uh, it's a pleasure to have you at Lyman. I mean, I'm as one of the Lyman chairs myself. I look forward to meeting you very soon, hopefully in London. Yeah, see you next week. See you next week. Um, other than MUN, I know you're pretty active within your university as well, within the King's College, at least when you were a student there, because now that you're a graduate. Um, and I know you've held positions like the treasurer of King's College London International Relations Society, the treasurer of King's College London ASEAN Society. So I've held a number of treasurer positions, which is interesting. I'm going to get back to that. <laughs> um, do you think that those experiences prepare you to uh, become the Secretary General of the largest MUN conference in Europe? Or, or how did they prepare you for that matter? Yeah, no, definitely. I feel like um, beyond just being treasurer for these two specific societies, I think those probably were raised because they're definitely the yeah. most closely linked to mm -hmm. model United Nations in terms of the content of what these societies do. So International Relations Society used to run lots of panel events kind of where we bring in diplomats, we organize kind of embassy visits, stuff like that. So very similar to what model UN does and very similar to what Lyman's side events are. So that direct link definitely helped me with kind of... Um, you know, getting ready to, or, or getting the experience and the skills required to run a conference at this scale. Uh, so I think that definitely helped. Uh, with regards to ASEAN Society, it's a, it's a bit more different in terms of the focus. ASEAN Society was more about, you know, recognizing what ASEAN is, spreading awareness of what ASEAN is as a regional organization, but also really making sure that ASEAN members felt like they were at home. So that gave me more event organizing experience as treasurer because we were a smaller team, I think, than International Relations Society by a little bit. Um, and I also had a subcommittee kind of working with me um, in ASEAN Society. So it's a lot of people management there. It's a lot of event management there and not just side events that you would see at Lyman, but really like uh, larger scale events where it's probably like a movie night or like something like that. So it's kind of, working on teamwork, working on people management, working on event management. So I feel like those two, same position, but um, definitely helped in terms of uh, preparing myself for Lyman. It also definitely helped the way that I saw kind of how to lead Lyman, kind of shaped the way I wanted to lead my secretariat uh, as sec gen for Lyman, because, you know, the more you kind of work in un university kind of societies and stuff like that, you'll realize there's so many different types of leadership styles out there. Um, so for me, that's kind of how it shaped the way I wanted to lead Lyman, which mm -hmm. is very much serving by leading. So kind of making sure that I do know what what's kind of going on at all times. And I, I, I do help out as much as I can with essentially whatever 
you know, my USGs want me to help out with is kind of making sure that even if it's a menial task, I'll like set aside time to do it and stuff like that. So it's, it's very, that's kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to make sure that you were a team member first and a team player first and then your position second. So that was something that mm-hmm. I think was really important to me kind of through these experiences. And that's kind of something that I really learned. Uh, so that's something that I definitely wanted to kind of stress on. But really, beyond these two societies, I think I was involved in quite a lot of random ones. Um, I don't um, I don't know if you, yeah. I think I was involved in quite a lot of random societies that weren't directly linked to kind of diplomacy or current affairs or international relations. And I think, you know, university is a very good time to kind of explore, because I'm sure a lot of the audience here are mm-hmm. universities, are current university students. It's a very good time to explore kind of what you like to. So beyond beyond you know what your course kind of makes you feel like you should be doing and to be honest if I didn't enjoy model united nations if I didn't enjoy international relations there's no way I would have done this like it's it's not a project that I did just because it's linked to my degree it's something I genuinely really enjoyed doing and it's something I really enjoyed kind of organizing too so that's definitely something that I kind of took away from um, my experiences uh, in these society positions yeah. So it, it's passion then, after all, also that kind of, you know, gives you that energy to oh, 100%, be a part yeah. of, of these activities for such a long time then, right? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I started Model United Nations, kind of just zooming into Model United Nations uh, instead of IR or ASEAN. Um, Model UN was something that I started when I was 15, and it was not a very smooth start. Mm-hmm. Like, I spoke like twice the first time I did Model UN. Um, in fact, I didn't even start Model UN as as a debate uh, as a delegate. I started as a note passer because you you used to get volunteering hours in Singapore oh. as a note passer and free food and like a cute T-shirt for free. Okay. So I'm like, yeah, of course I'll sign up for this Model UN thing. And I just thought it was debate because I've been exposed to be, to debate by that point. But it was nothing like that, and it was something that I found really intriguing, and kind of I had a very rocky start. I would say that the first award I won was when I was like 16 and a half, like four conferences. And uh, <laughs> like, I used to just go there and talk to everyone to make friends, not to actually debate. Okay. Um, but, but, you know, it's something that I, I realized, oh, this is something I actually like doing. I like spend my weekends like this. I really like delegating. I really like the public speaking aspect of it. I really like, like, you know, these events. And then slowly but surely I realized, okay, don't just want to debate as a delegate. I want to start chairing. I want to like write study guides I want to facilitate debate I want to you know kind of take control of like academically uh, of what's happening and then um really with regards to you know being on secretariat that's something that I only really realized I was passionate and I really enjoyed doing and real frankly it's my favorite part of more UN now is that was something that I only started doing um in university I hadn't been on a secretariat before university mm-hmm. um and you know organizing Lyman last year organizing a few other kind of smaller mall UN conferences here and there has made me realize this is this is what I really enjoy doing like yeah. you know like this, making this you know kind of opportunity to do more United Nations like make it accessible make it whatever that's what I really liked doing um and that's kind of also you know that the kind of passion is what kept me fueling to kind of do this throughout university even though you know university schedules are so incredibly hectic as students so yeah. that's kind of really what's keeping me going so yeah you're completely right yeah so the, the element of passion is there which is pretty pretty clear exactly yeah um and and other than MUN as well although MUN itself is, is an extracurricular activity for a lot of people and it can already be pretty um exhausting for those people who are doing MUN as like their only extracurricular activity I found out that you have a pretty active non-MUN extracurricular life as well. Um, I think you played piano for quite a while, if I'm not mistaken. You were the president of the King's Baking Society. And one yep. of my sources relates to me that your your cookies, the, the cookies that you baked are amazing, which mm-hmm. uh, is an information I'm going to keep in mind as I'm going to be in London <laughs> this week. <laughs> Um, but yeah, to, to, to go over those very briefly, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about those uh, experiences and, and do you think, it, is it really important that in terms of the extracurricular life, especially in university, because you touched mm-hmm. upon that just like a few minutes ago, that MUN is not the only extracurricular thing that we're doing? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Um, firstly, the person who is your source did in fact tell me uh, <laughs> that you had approached them. So Philip, if you're watching, uh, okay. thank you for 
Um, thank you for telling uh, Tarek about my cookies. I hope I'm glad you enjoyed them. <laughs> so um, I think it's definitely really important in university, especially to really branch out and do what you want to do. And that's kind of why Model UN is it's my main extracurricular. It's what I've put in the most time into. Mm-hmm. But I've really tried to kind of get involved, you know, with what you mentioned just now about International Relations Society, Arts and Society. I, I, I was very conscious that university was essentially the last type of chance that you got to really explore these things before yeah. you kind of enter the working world, right? Because um, I, came, I came into my undergraduate knowing that I didn't want to do a master straight away. I wanted to work for a few years, maybe take a gap year or two, which is currently what I'm doing, I'm taking a gap year right now, kind of work for a few years, know what I want to do, and then go in for a master's. But I was very conscious that as, like, when I was 19, when I first went into university, that, you know, being in your late teens, early 20s, this was your last chance, really, to kind of, you know, have, you know, have a group of, or community in university of people who have the same interests as you, and to really kind of pursue that. Um... And that's kind of why I think I kept with baking society. I kept with kind of my other extracurriculars outside. I used to also do debate in high school. Uh, that was something that I was also quite passionate about. And I did um, kind of concurrently with Model UN. I stopped in university because I really don't like the debating style of British parliamentary. Um, so that's a different style of debate than what I used to do. Uh, and that's why I stopped. But really, I knew that Model UN was competitive. And I knew that it was something that I, I am very, very competitive person myself. It was something that I knew stressed me. It was something that I knew made me really fired up about, you know, getting that award or whatnot when I was, you know, still in my early, like my late teens, mm-hmm. early 20s. I am still in my early 20s, but you go know what I mean. And, and I, think, I think doing things like baking society, doing things like playing the piano still um, was what kept me kind of sane, not really sane, but like to make sure that I'm still out there pursuing interests that I'm doing. Uh, beyond Model UN because Model UN especially when you start organizing when you're doing chairing it can be a lot of work it is you know even as a chair you're writing what 20 pages 30 pages of like academic writing for one singular conference and no one only really chairs one conference a year right you're doing multiple of them it's a whole commitment even as a delegate really to kind of like on in every aspect of doing Model United Nations there is a certain minimum of commitment that you're putting in you know and stuff like that and I think I liked balancing it with things that weren't necessarily competitive, but just, you know, made me realize that's things that I enjoyed. So, for example, Baking Society, the reason why I became president of Baking Society was because um, at the end of first year, uh, I ran for a position in my university's United Nations Association and I lost. Mm -hmm. I lost because uh, I took a very long break from all UN and I I came in at the last minute. I thought I could win it just because I was very experienced. Um, I didn't and I was really upset for a while um, because I put in a lot of effort into it and I think I had a chat with a few friends and I had a chat with some seniors of mine that I knew from Singapore as well as in uni they were all kind of like at the end of the day firstly it's just a student society which Mm -hmm. obviously helped and secondly they were like do something that isn't competitive because you're doing you you, because they were saying that you know you're doing more UN like this is like something that's like almost like a mini career of yours within university and within high school right that's kind of how people in Singapore used to kind of refer to model UN they would say oh I'm retiring from model UN once I get into university stuff like that you know like almost akin to like having a career and they were like what makes you happy like what 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 do you do when like what's your hobby and I was like I really like baking you know um so why not join baking society like there's nothing competitive well we have like a little mini version of like a great british bake-off between some universities but you know like beyond that like what what do you do you meet up once every two weeks you go into a kitchen or you bring just baked goods that you've made you share them you you have a chat about your week uh you know like or you have like bake-alongs online when when covid happened you know like that's kind of that the kind of like friendly community was something that i really appreciated and it was something that I really enjoyed doing on the side. And I definitely think that having these extracurriculars on the side to kind of keep you sane throughout university to make you happy is definitely something that people should explore. Because I, I can bet you a lot of people who are listening to this podcast or people who do more UN are people who probably study international relations, probably study history, probably something related to global affairs, related yeah. to current affairs. And at the end of the day, Model UN can seem very much like something that you're doing because it's related to your degree, can seem like something that is stressful, but really, you so really you need to find things to balance it out. Uh, on your point about the piano, actually, uh, 
that was something that I started when I was a kid. I started when I was four, and I got um the, I got my diploma when I was like 13, 12 or thirteen, and and then any and like I can tell you I don't really remember how to play any of the uh, classical pieces I was trained in. Um, mm-hmm. because it's been basically almost 10 years since then but I, I do it for fun because it keeps me sane uh you know um so I think that's definitely something that people should definitely go and try and do find something that is a hobby that has basically no strings attached not attached to your course not attached to what what makes you competitive not attached to anything that might cause you stress you know so yeah and um point, Philip yeah. was talking about cookies before because I bake for the secretary a lot like like every every, like every other week when we have our in-person meetings uh I just find something the meetings are held in my flat um I just find some time bake a plate of cookies or like do something that de-stresses me from a week of of work basically so yeah I'm really I'm really glad to hear that I think it's it's honestly speaking very inspiring because I think that is also something that could help you make these extracurricular things like MUN itself less toxic for yourself because it can become toxic as you said it can become quite tiring 100 percent. It, yeah. it really can become pretty disappointing at times so I, I really like that perspective over there and I think a lot of the people in our audience will relate to that experience um so to, to move a little bit towards the bigger picture then how do you think does the foundation of, of world mold UN they contribute to the ever-expanding network of muns all over the world because you are someone who started doing this on the other side of the world in singapore where uh, as someone who's, who's been in east, east asia for almost four years i'm also where the culture there in terms of mun and, and extracurriculars in general are quite different you've, you've seen how this is happening in europe you're leading one right now um so how do you think this initiative the world mold UN the initiative is contributing to that network of MUNs all over the world right now? I mean, I do definitely think that this initiative is really helpful in terms of kind of um, bridging that kind of gap between different regions and whatnot, because really when my experience in Singapore and kind of been in Southeast Asia, because uh, I didn't really venture that much outside of it, is that international conferences are their little bubble and local conferences are definitely within their little bubble too. So kind of World Model UN Day, this, this initiative definitely helps kind of bridge that gap between, um, you know, different different regions, different countries, and what Model UN and, that, and their cultures there kind of stand for. Um, because you're right, you know, my experience in Singapore in Model UN was definitely very, very different uh, than in, in Europe, in the UK and in Europe, to be honest. Because... Um, kind of towards the end of my time in Singapore, before I went to university, I had chaired at um, Harvard Model United Nations China. And I had also delegated at Harvard Model Congress Asia. So much more international conferences with a lot more uh, delegates coming in from kind of around the region and across the world um, for these conferences. And the kind of, the atmosphere was so much more different from what I was used to, uh, even though I was quite experienced at that point, by that point, um, kind of within the Singaporean circuit. Mm-hmm. So I definitely think that, you know, you know, the number of part, the, the kind of like number of partners that World, World Model UN Day kind of does, as um, and as well as, you know, the significance behind making it kind of an international thing is is really, it's, you know, it really does help bridge that gap between all of these things. And I do think that, you know, expanding this little, this network of more UN, uh, MUNs kind of all across the world, is really really um is something that i think is really quite inspiring and really helpful i think to establishing more united nations yeah so yeah as in as a, as a global activity i guess as you said in terms yeah, of exactly, uh, exactly. Like those gaps exactly that's, that's exactly what we're trying to do and we really hope we can uh we can take that a step further about what we're trying to do over here um, just yeah. a very quick question to kind of wrap up the conversation because I think it was important to mention this as well since you mentioned how you try and, and balance that you know professional uh, commitments you had in the university with your extracurricular ones so how do you think those experiences throughout your university life prepared you for the professional one and I, and I think you made a very sane decision there by not going into work <laughs> right away or by not going into grad school right away either and I really want to kind of explore that decision a little bit uh, and, and want to hear how those experiences you think prepared you uh, and, or is preparing you for the for the professional life ahead. Oh, I definitely think that Molo UN, you know, it doesn't even have to be kind of the position I'm in, right, as like Jen. Mm-hmm. Every step in the way will definitely help you for a professional career, be it if you want to go into higher education, be it if you want to go into the corporate world, be it if you want to go into the diplomatic sphere. 
it's so helpful because at the end of the day, I don't think Molly Yuan people give themselves enough credit for what they do, to be honest. You are essentially debating for three days straight and not just debating in the vacuum of the committee, you're lobbying in between that. You're writing papers, you're writing resolutions, you're thinking up of solutions and then actually translating that into, in, into you know, a, speci- a very restrictive type of a format, which is the resolution and clauses, right? I think it's, I think it's, I think it's something that you can definitely talk about a lot, and it's something that I've talked about quite a lot, um, in my interviews, you know, in my internships, as well as kind of in, um, you know, more professionally focused uh, societies I've taken part in. Um, so it's definitely very helpful. I think Lyman, for example, runs three side events that talk about this. Uh, we call it the Young Professionals Panels, where we where we get Lyman alumni to come in and talk about kind of um, how Lyman has helped them get to where they are. Mm-hmm. So um, that was something that was super eye opening for me when I first became when I was first a delegate in Lyman back in 2020. You know, like to listen to that kind of experience, and I think. Every step of the way, from being a delegate, from being a chair, from being a secretary member, 100% helps you with, um, you know, your professional career and your professional experience. And I think that more UN was definitely also something that pushed me towards taking a gap year. Mm-hmm. Because I knew that the first deal I was going to take up a lot of my time, which is, um, I really enjoy it. And secondly, um, you know, the experience of doing Lyman definitely gives you, you know, or, or really model UN in general, gives you context, give you, gives you you know, um, gives you kind of opportunities to kind of speak to more people and really figure out what you want to do, yeah. right? Because almost like the things that I've done as a chair and the things that I've done as a as a secretary member definitely like f- parallel what you might want to do in the professional sphere. So it's very similar to what you want to do in a think tank, for example, if you want to go into diplomacy. Uh, I did USG logistics. I was USG logistics last year. I'm now I'm sec, sec gen, but um, definitely really helpful. And for example is event management something I want to do like that that's a bit more out there but you know like was that something I wanted to do you know you know how many 20 21 year olds can you talk to that said oh I handled the logistics of a thousand person conference and I spoke to um, this venue and that professional um, capacity I think that's something that people you know need to give themselves more credit for in getting these experiences and and even even public speaking basic public speaking you know getting western business attire on all of that definitely helps with, you know, um, preparing yourself for the professional world, yeah. preparing yourself for, you know, just even interacting with your interviewers, interacting with your professors. So I definitely think Model UN, every step of the way, 100% a really good help for your professional career. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. I can only and only agree, Olivia. Yeah. And thank you so much once again for joining us. It was one of the most uh, interesting conversations I had since the MUN talk started. And I think it's going to it's gonna be that way for a while. So thanks a lot for being so sincere and sparing the time. Mm-hmm. And we really hope uh, to, to keep in touch in the future as well. Of course. Thank you so much for your time. It was a really enjoyable conversation. And yeah.